To celebrate publishing over 100 episodes of the Fishing the DMV podcast and surpassing 2,000 subscribers on YouTube, I am giving away a free guided fishing trip with Billy Coles of Smith Mountain Lake Fishing Guide Services. The giveaway will run through Wednesday, April 5th through Saturday, May 6th, and I'm going to give you three unique opportunities to win the fishing trip. Number one, the number one way that you can enter the competition is by leaving a review of the show at Apple Podcasts. After the review at the very bottom, comment hashtag fishing the DMV and you're automatically entered in the sweepstakes. Number two, commenting on every video that I drop from Wednesday, April 5th through Saturday, May 6th. And then at the end of your comment, leave hashtag fishing the DMV. And then you're again entered to win the competition. Number three, the final way that you can enter a chance to win is by ordering online from Jake's Bait and Tackle. Every online order through them automatically enters you with a chance to win as long as you leave the hashtag fishing the DMV. The contest again runs through Wednesday, April 5th through Saturday, May 6th. Good luck. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. And, and then guys, to make sure I don't forget, I've been staring at the snow all night and I'm just actually reading it. Um, we're gonna add to the trip giveaway with this guy here. Um, if you go to his YouTube channel, and you subscribe to the channel that will also enter you in a chance to win the guided trip with yours truly. And he'll even wear the captain hat possibly, uh, if you win the trip. I mean, I really want to start off kind of like with a quick recap of the BFLs. Cause I think, yeah, I haven't talked to you since the first BFL and now we're, we got two, two in the box. Yeah. So, and we've, we've done a pre tournament, you know, analysis. And I know we we're talking a little bit before we got started here, but yeah, you know, what was it like? you know, this past weekend, I mean, they absolutely freaking just smashed them on that leg, yes. which is awesome to see. Yeah. It, uh, Smith definitely showed its colors, uh, seven bags over 20. I had 17, five good for a whopping 22nd place. Um, which is good. I should be on a, a, a good stringer with the amount of time that I've been on the water, but yeah, the lake, the lake totally showed out. I'm pretty sure it was just kind of like a blind bed fish or you're straight up looking at them, um, kind of bonanza with everybody. It sounded like a lot of shaky head dragon, um, just actually flipping on, on bed fish. I know a couple of guys that fished out a little bit deeper, but we had huge waves of fish, um, that came in a little bit before practice started. And then a cold front came in another decent wave of fish, uh, came in. But for me, I bed fished the whole tournament. Um, Co-angler caught a big one, which great for him, uh, stung a little bit, kind of, it was early enough in the day that I kind of brushed it off. And then I just didn't have enough time on, uh, on another four pounder to, to connect those two, but I fished clean, I had to sit on one fish for like an hour, um, which is unfortunate, unfortunate, but it was a four twenty eight, something like that. Um, I can tell you the story of that in a second, but overall, I mean, super solid tournament. Uh, a lot of local guys did really good. A lot of non-local guys uh, came up and, and did really well. So I'm happy the lake the lake showed out. Um, the story on that four pounder, because maybe my co-angler will uh, will listen to this, but I, I appreciated him quite a bit on it. But it was a super thick lay down. Like the hole I had to shoot in was like maybe the size of a soccer ball um, for an hour straight, wow. flipping a bunch of different baits. Um, and it ended up that I had to flip a drop shot in there to get her to actually commit to anything. She wouldn't really eat a beaver. She was just kind of spitting it out. Um, but I told my co-angler, I said, Hey, get the net ready. I was like, this could be potential like nightmare fuel. Um, and he, this was his first BFL. So he didn't really know what to expect, but I hooked her on seven pound line and I set the hook and it went straight in and wrapped around a pine cone. And the fish literally was dangling out of the water, seven pound line, just cutting the line against a pine cone, raised the rafters, 10 trolling motors straight in. And that co-angler jumped on the front deck, fully extended net laying down where I almost had to like grab his belt to like have him not fall forward. Um, and straight scooped her up, dude. It was awesome. And we, we got her in the boat and he was like, I don't know how you stayed so calm through that. And I was like, but whatever happens was going to happen. And, and he said he was literally shaking. Um, when I set the hook, he was so nervous to net the fish, but 
that was a cool that was a cool experience for him um and he caught uh he caught the big one on a floating worm which he was kind of telling me a story about that's what his dad used to have him throw as a kid was like a methylate floating worm so he thought that was pretty cool that his first bfl fish was pushing pushing five on a floating worm that his dad kind of taught him how to fish down at norman so um that was that one and then the previous i guess we haven't talked since the since the previous bfl no um if you remember i was smashing them super deep like super super deep the deepest i've mm-hmm. i've been catching them and um i was catching big smallies and the tournament day it blew like 35 mile an hour like sustained um so that one i told my co-angler i said if anything dude we can at least go to the ramp and say we were the most badass mofos out here because i took them <laughs> into like five foot rollers the whole day like we were oh, wow. literally like off balance um the whole day but i fished deep because i was really on them deep and i wasn't on anything shallow and i fished for four hours deep and had two bites um and i switched shallow at 11 o'clock went to a rock pile through a 3-3 swim bait got train railed and broke off grabbed a jerk bait threw in there and caught a 598 and there was six fish on live scope so whatever I broke off was probably in that like four and a half to six pound range. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I was able to just go um, crank up two more little fish. I think I had like 15, 15 or something like that. I think I got ended up in 13th on that. But I was proud of myself for adjusting, even though I hadn't found anything shallow at all in like five days. Um, doing that. But I, I broke a Raptor fiberglass pole like... I wrapped it down when I caught that big one and the boat swung and I looked back and my raptors are supposed to be like this and they're like, um, and straight snapped one of the fiberglass poles. I mean, it was, it was super rough out there. Um, but yeah, that one, that one was good. I obviously wish I would have been able to go fish any of my deep stuff, but, um, that one didn't end up that great, but I mean, dude, two top 25s and two BFLs. I mean, I'll, I'll take that any day. No, I mean, and that's what's so interesting when you live there, is it make it easier or harder to make adjustments? Because with the with the first tournament, let's go with that one. You had a great game plan for deep and you know that it was working. Is it hard for you to then detach that and then just go fish the bank like that, even though you do have experience? No, I think it helps me. Um, I know when I'm trying to I can feel when I'm trying to force something. Like if I check six or seven spots on something that may have been working yesterday or a couple days before, and they're either following it on live scope or the conditions are completely different. Um, that one, I was able to say at 11, like, okay, I've tried this enough. I, if anything, I should have done it earlier. Um, just with the wind howling and kind of where the water temperature was fluctuating at, like I knew there had to be fish shallow somewhere. Um, and that was just kind of, that was honestly very lucky to pick that rock pile to start on. And then once I saw those six fish and the, and the caliber, I just said, all right, we're going to, we're going to fish where the winds, where the winds cracking. Um, so that one, and then this one that we just had this weekend, I kind of did the whole, like, you know, zig when you zag or whatever, whatever cliche saying you want to say, but I was absolutely smashing them um with guide clients up the roanoke um just throwing little swim baits some bigger swim baits but mostly matching the hatch like little swim baits and that was bite was completely dying off leading up to the tournament um so i think when we talked last time before that bfl i told you too i said the spawning wave is going to be massive and it totally was um, the biggest wave i've seen of females you called it yeah in any push like dude i had two fish almost seven pounds in 10 days for guide for guide clients and that's like me saying like cast over here cast that's like not me going out and fishing um so i was and multiple i had almost a five to five and a half pounder like every trip for almost 10 days um which was just amazing but as soon as we got that super cold like one or two days the big ones pushed off and then we got like very few I mean, I, I practiced after every guide trip leading up to the BFL, I'd go practice for like five, six hours. So you figure I had 20 hours almost of looking for more, for more. And I only had 
seven bed fish that I thought were bigger than four pounds, I had 15 bed fish marked that were between like two and a half and three and a half. Um, so it wasn't that big of a, at least for me, it wasn't that big of a wave. Um, but anyways, what, what messed we up on the tournament was I ran halfway up the Roanoke at one o'clock and I went and threw that stupid swim bait and I got four bites in a row and they were small, but I was like, oh man, they haven't been eating the swim bait in a couple days. And then I ran all the way up almost to Beaver Dam um, from catching fish on the lower end and went up there for 45 minutes and all they did was follow it on live scope. So I burned mm -hmm. through 45 minutes of fishing plus 20 minutes up there plus 20 minutes back. So I burned through too much, uh, too much time and I should have just kind of put my head down and kind of what everybody else did, picked up a shaky head and just kind of blind dragged around and felt for hard spots or, or stuff like that. I actually, believe it or not, threw a Carolina rig a little bit. Um, oh man, bring it old school. Well, old school. And I hate it with a burning heart passion, um, because I can't, I'm either using bad line combinations or the wrong rod. Like I switched rods finally, cause I think I'm just using too stiff of a rod, but I, I break off like eight out of 10. Um, really? Yeah, it's just something I gotta. I just gotta work with it, and I just don't waste. I just don't take the time to uh, to do it. So, I got a couple of bites in practice on a Carolina rig, dragged that around a little bit. Um, but yeah, I just made made maybe the wrong adjustment to to not go. Just look for, you know, a four to six pound fish that was moving up. But I had a guide trip today, and there's still tons of fish moving up, and we're supposed to be in the 80s for the next couple of days. So, there'll probably be another another decent wave. And there's two things to unpack there. I mean, the first is like, I, I do believe that not every fish in the lake or river spawns at the same time. And so when everyone says like, you know, it's, it, they're going to all be spawning in a week or two, they're all going to be post spawning. That's just never the nope. case or, or rarely never. is the case, which if you're going to be like trying to do a tournament or you're planning for a tournament, always keep that in mind, try to fish to your strength there. And then when it comes to the spawning aspect of it, I think this is interesting. You said about marking fish. How long are they going to be on a bed that you're going to keep that mark on your GPS unit compared to like that fish that I marked on Monday is probably not going to be there on a Saturday. Yep. Generally. So let's unpack the first thing first. I think there's waves. I think there's four waves in a spawn in my opinion. So April, May, June, full moons, there will be fish that are going to move up. April's mm -hmm. usually the largest wave, but there's going to be waves all the way up to June. I've caught, big bed fish at Smith into mid June, like random ones, super random ones, but still like four or five fish in the month of June, I'm pulling off of a bed. Um, so April is definitely bigger. I think when you approach a tournament, look at where you are full moon and where you are April, May, June, and figure out where's the, what is the largest population of bass doing as far as pre spawn or post. And that's how you should approach how you can break it down. Like, you know, the springtime is a little bit easier and a little bit more textbook as far as like, where's the females? Do you go up shallow and it's all bucks? The females are eight to 14 feet deep or they're back a couple points. Like it's pretty, it's pretty strategic about where you can go to find the big ones. You just have to work back um, from where you're finding the smaller ones. So that, that part's not as difficult, but um there wasn't really any top water stuff that I found. I know one one of the big ones, one of the, I think it was the 712, the guy said he caught it on a buzz bait. That doesn't surprise me with the amount of shad and stuff that I had up the river. Um, I just never was able to connect with with a buzz bait. It's about to be lights out here. The shad spawn's definitely starting. I was helping a guy at um, down in Mariners jump his boat after the tournament at like 9, 30, 10 o'clock at night, and we heard like seven or eight like substantial blowups on the riprap. Um, so that's starting. So that, that kind of, um, your first point, your second point rarely is a, is a female going to stay on a bed enough for you to be able to catch her more than like three days, I think is like a max. Um, but I also think like I talked to a few buddies too, it's like some of these bed tournaments, like a guy's just going to run into a six pounder that moved up from that moved from a dock post four feet away to the bed like that day. And that's the only day she's going to be there. And there's a six hour window where she's actually not spawning where she'll sit there and maybe eat. Um, like I went out Thursday 
before the tournament because Friday was calling for a little bit of rain and stuff like that. I marked a six pounder that was like pretty locked on and I went to her at 845 Saturday and the buck and her were both gone. So, wow. um, yeah, I mean, just, just gone, but that four, that 428 that I caught, that was, I caught her in a guide trip like six days before. So she was kind of a weird one, I guess, but I, I would say the general rule is like a, a female is going to be around ish for three days max. That's interesting. Okay. That's interesting. And, and, and just to clarify for the people that are, that are watching at home, you're marking the fish or are you marking a bed fish? There's too many. So you can kind of use the beds actually, or rather I should say the empty beds as a, um, breaking down an area. Like if you go to an area and the beds are obvious that they're fresh beds, which what you can tell or how you can tell that is the sediment hasn't reset on the beds. Like it's the, the rocks are very defined. The white shells are bright white. Like you can see where they've actively brushed it away as opposed to like in a month after boat traffic hits it in wind, like it'll still be there, but it's like silted over a little bit. If you run into three, four pockets, in a major creek arm and eight out of 10 beds are empty, that area is already spawned out um, where you should be able to be confident to go into a pocket and all of a sudden, like today for, for the guide trip that I just wrapped up, took us maybe two hours to find the right pockets. But when we went into the right pockets, it was literally every single stump for 400 yards had either a buck or a three pounder on it. It was like every mm -hmm. single stump um and that's just how you could use kind of the marking the beds there's too many empty ones to mark that on your graph i really only marked ones where either the female was like really close or the female was locked on and um what i mean by really close on the female is like if the trolling motor spooked her she didn't like dart off and then disappear like if i spooked her and she went five six feet out and like kind of hovered I would, I would mark that as like, Hey, I can come back and keep the boat super far away and, uh, and see if I could flip something on her from, you know, just kind of blind cast on her, um, and do it that route. So how, how do you incorporate? And I've had this conversation with a couple of, couple of guests about if you are strategizing for a tournament, how do you incorporate your bed fish into your game plan when you're dealing with a one day event and, and, and just to add a little bit more context there. Is there a size in which if there is a six pounder on a bed that you saw Friday at that point, it doesn't have to be six. You can come up with the weight that at that point, that is the first place I go just to make sure if she's there, I get on her first. Yep. Or are you purely pre-spawn finding something that you can fill a limit and then hunt for a couple of beds? Because I feel like it is so hard to just try to purely bed fish tournaments. And there are guys that can do it and you can look into it. But I feel like now with so many tournaments going in and out, it's hard to find. Yeah. You know, five good ones consistently without a backup plan. I would say that it's not complicated, but there's, there's multiple layers to that. If you have the time on the water, like I do, I was able to tell, I, I could not get a great pre-spawn bite going, believe it or not. And to be honest, I know you and you and me are kind of the big swim bait, like talker guys, dude, I have not had a great <laughs> big swim bait spring at all. I think I've caught seven really? fish on a mag draft all spring. I have had 50 plus followers on a mag draft all the way out to the boat. Like, dude, I'm, I'm talking, I'm buying weird swim baits now to try to get something that looks a little bit different. Um, but I never connected with the swim bait bite this spring. I don't know what, I don't know if it was when I was in Mexico, it really popped off and I missed it, or I don't know what it was, but I knew with the time that I had on the water that the only way for me to do well was I I'm I had a competitive advantage to go mark bed fish because some guys are only going to get two days and Friday ended up being a cloudy rainy day where they weren't going to able to find beds. Um, I haven't had a lot. It's so freaking weird. I have not caught one this year on a big one, even a little creeper nine inch. Mm -hmm. That's so freaking weird. I caught one that was he was about three. Yeah. That's weird. I wonder if it has to do with that that warmer winter because if it's affecting you and it's up here, it's been an issue too. Huh. Yeah, I just, I, I mean, dude, I know a couple of guys here that have had absolute crazy days on it, but then I've also talked to them, you know, three days after they have a mega bag and they're like, nope, 
we didn't get a single bite. It's like the last three springs, you could throw any kind of big swim bait and I could go out and catch three like pretty easily on it. Um, so I, I kind of, I didn't even have one on the deck. Um, I just, I just put it away. I felt like it was just going to be kind of more of a, a drag thing. So for me, I drew boat 11, which was double edged sword. I wanted an early number so that I could get to a couple obvious beds. And I went to a small mouth first because if anybody knows that fish is enough, if you have a small mouth on a bed and you throw a hot dog down there within four feet, you're going to catch it. So mm -hmm. I ran to a small mouth first, but I also have a pretty good kind of feel for springtime that you're really not going to get good locked on fish until like noon. Like if you don't, unless you have a really, really warm night that was slick calm, a lot of those fish aren't going to lock on a bed until later in the day. Um, and then we got kind of a weird weather for the BFL that morning. It got super dense fog till like nine thirty, ten 10 o'clock, um, to where I was blind casting on the small mouth that I went to first. And then I ran to a four pounder that I couldn't get to bite and then ran to one that was almost five caught her. And then it was so dense that I was just blind casting at beds and I didn't really get to see beds until like 10 or 11. And if you looked at the weights, when I left, when I left weigh in, I think I was in seventh. Um, and you can tell a lot of the 20 pound plus bags came after, came on the later flights. So those guys just got more time with fish that were locked on. That is some really good information guys. If you're, if you're at home, really be taking notes on that because your boat draw is so freaking important in your strategy of the day, whether you're fishing the, you know, local community holes in the Potomac river, or you're down at Smith or Kerr. If you're the 200th, that's going to be way different of a strategy than if you're, you know, in the top 10, that, that yeah. is interesting. Yeah. And I mean, huh. dude, you got to think about it with fish. I mean, Will always beats this into my head. Fish can swim is some guys <laughs> probably, some guys probably ran into a female that I wouldn't have even had a chance to fish for because she came up at, 240 you know like somebody probably caught a big one within the last 30 minutes that i wouldn't have even been able to swing on because they got an extra 45 minutes of fishing um and that's just that's just how it ended out so i was excited about the draw number just because um i was hoping i could go pluck a few three pound plus smallies off and i felt like i had enough if i if i could have connected with three four to five pound largemouth and then three or two three and a half pound smallies i would have been like ecstatic but we also had a fishers of men here on that did a two day uh and their first day was friday so mm. that first smallmouth i ran to was gone i'm sure somebody i'm sure somebody caught her on uh caught her on friday she was gone so in a perfect world how many beds do you want to have marked before blast off my goal was to have, I wanted to have 15 that were four, four plus, And I had six, 15, six or six, like six or seven. So yeah, I just made that mistake. Yeah, that I just, just I like, just made the mistake. Uh, I just made the mistake running up the river, which also, this is why fishing is just funny and makes me laugh, especially competitive fishing is if I would have smashed them up the river, I would have been like, I'm a God, I'm the most genius adjuster ever. Like I am so perfect. And like it's it's just it is what it is you just got to take it like a man and i just uh i just didn't look out and those fish weren't there i probably should have just went up there earlier and in, in that fog and thrown a buzz bait or done something something way more off the wall but yeah 17 pounds is still solid in a bfl though i mean like if if your worst finish is just you know 22nd place i think you're gonna be okay i think i'll be okay i'll survive <laughs> I'll survive. I mean, and then plus you've been on the water. Like, I think you said 200 days. No, I think it was like 20 days consistently. Like it, that's just like, do you ever get afraid of, I think Kevin Van Dam said this once about if you're on the water too much, you actually sometimes make stupid little mistakes because it's just so repetitive. It's like, ah, I don't sharpen the hook. I don't tie that extra knot because you're like, do you ever feel like that starts creeping in and you have to like kick yourself to, to just try to stay at that high level? Um, I think if anything, it's trying different baits 
you know, like um, with guiding, if I have a half day trip, again, I've said this to you before, I get to take them to six to eight spots maybe, and they better catch a fish. That's what they're, that's what they're coming out to do. So I need to make an adjustment on baits like every other stop um, to do that. And when you go out there on such a repetitive basis and one bait's working, you kind of lock it in maybe a little, maybe a little bit longer than you should. Um, so I, I did do, I did kind of knock myself back a little bit on, uh, on one half day trip where I was done by like, I think I was done at like noon or two o'clock and I came home and I cleaned the whole boat out, um, and just kind of like re refocused and re like I have hook hangers for plastics. I took all those off. I kind of put the swim baits to the side in a side compartment. Um, and kind of pulled out more like the worms, Ned rigs, drop shots, shaky head, um, and a bunch of variations of those baits just to force myself to look at those when I open the, the tackle storage section a little bit more. Mm. Um, and then what I was mentioning kind of with the swim bait, like you could try to force the swim bait, but if it wasn't there, Hey honey. Yeah, that's fine. Um, yeah. Um, trying to force the swim bait um i put them like low in the rod locker like i just kind of put them down in there same with the glides and stuff like that i just i didn't want to try to uh force something that i i knew was kind of on the tail end on the way out i truly i don't know how you do it i had um interview that that dropped while this was that we recorded this one was uh, captain steve chaconis and and captain chris uh, who both guide on the title Potomac. And, and the one thing I think is interesting is like, it's hard to guide and then try to be a competitive tournament angler and do both. It's insanely freaking hard because you're either going to get completely into the guiding part of it and you might lose your competitive edge a little bit, or you're still trying to be the next Mike Iconelli. And then you probably are terrible for your guides because you don't want to tell them anything. You want to be super tight lipped. And it's hard to balance that. And, and you seem, you know, based on your, your your stats and everything, you've made it work. And that's a gift to do that because it's hard. Thanks, man. Yeah, I try to I try to keep them somewhat separated. Um, my goal with guiding, obviously, I want them to catch the biggest fish um, that they can, but at the same time, like I have to adjust for say, like castability, like that's probably a huge thing that a lot of a lot of guides think about and talk about is like, okay, well, if I need them to skip a Senko 25 feet under a platform dock, like I can do that for them. But do they want to experience the guide trip in the form of I'm going to cast for them and they catch the fish. Um, and so it's a little bit of that. But guiding also has a benefit of like, it does keep me in that like adjuster mode um, because uh -huh. if you don't get a lot of time on the water, as much as we all probably hate that I'm about to say this and we think we don't do it, you're going to gravitate towards the things that you used last time you were here that worked in the 100%. same time frame. That was interesting. Minute 27. You there? Yeah, I'm here. That was nice. Yeah, that's why we're good. That's why I got a redundant system in place. Was that you or me? <sighs> I have no idea. I have to check my Wi-Fi. On my end, it's showing that I got full bars. Okay. Do I need to go back? By the way, Taylor, uh, you me this hat. Should I wear this hat instead? You could wear that hat. Unless there's some kind of meta meaning to it. It's just says Captain. Yeah, let's just... Go. <laughs> That's what she brought. Yeah. Uh, Tell you what, yeah. If you get if you crack a top a top five and something, then you can wear the hat. You can wear whatever you want at that point. Did you see right. my? Eh. Go ahead. No, go for it. Go for it. Just oh, I was just gonna say, did you see my uh, the shirt Will's wife made for me, Hunt Brothers? No. So I have a, a joke that the only non systemic sponsor that I'll ever want is Hunt Brothers Pizza, which is just like gas station like amazing pizza. 
Um, but she made me a shirt that says Hunt Brothers Pizza, Captain Billy. So <laughs> I, ta- I tagged them, dude. I would, lo- I would wrap my truck and my boat in Hunt Brothers in a second, dude. I would do it. If I could get free food, that would really be amazing. Yeah. Anyways, that's a side note. Right. That's the captain jokes. Uh, let's see, 20. Perfect. All right. I'll just cut that out. Perfection. I have no idea. Where did you stop talking or where? <laughs> or I where think I was, I was talking about adjustments and guiding and yeah. time on the water and all that sort of stuff. So it does make you. So, so what I was saying was for the most part, let's say the guy you mentioned before, you've been a Smith for mm-hmm. 10 years in a row. You come in the same week in April you're going to literally tie on probably almost the same lures that you tie on every year after the fifth year where with guiding, like I might have to throw something else like a Ned rig. Like if I go to a tournament where I know I can power fish and it's early spring and stuff like that, like I'm not even really going to, it's going to be in the rod locker, not really thinking about it. And I'm telling you right now, after today, I probably could go out with a Ned rig and crack 17 pounds tomorrow. So the little bit of like balance between guiding and tournament fishing is that castability pieces is pretty big um, and how well they can present a bait versus me. Um, But I do think guiding does keep me on, keep me on my toes a little bit as far as speed goes too. I mean, dude, if I go to a spot that I have been to in the past this time of year and it's worked for two years in a row and I take a guide client there just to kind of look and see if they're there and they're not there. I will literally tell a guide client, all right, give me the rod. We're going to move. I won't even let them cast um, Mm. and move and move on to the next one. So it also keeps me kind of moving around or maybe I do that. Like I have some guide clients, dude, that tell me, man, we you fish really fast. Um, And it's like, well, that's how you get around active fish. Like, I'm not just going to have you guys come out here and drag something on five different points. Like if we have to check 12 spots, we'll do it. So you guys can get some bites. And plus that's, that's your style. And when you get a lake dialed in like to the ninth degree, that Brian thrift style works extremely well. Yep. Uh, when, when you have the pulse of the lake, cause you can, you know where to go for the, for the active fish. Yep. versus if it's like you've never been up before that can completely and that was my biggest thing my philosophy in college is i like brian thrift and kevin van damme's idea but you got to know the damn place and have some time to make that thing work because you, you can explode spectacularly if you don't know where the hell you're going next <laughs> yeah yeah for sure for sure so as we're going into may what is the height of this of the shad spawn really going to be taking place so I was going to do a, do an Instagram post on it too. So now that we've had a couple warmer stretches, I mean like three days of warm, the, the shad spawns about to pop off here. So, um, we have a couple different types of shad in here. Threadfin shad are our main forage. We have big gizzard shad in here, and then we have some blueback population in here, but your main shad spawn stuff that's going to go on is thread fins and how I explain it on guide trips and anybody that's never experienced a shad spawn is they are scatter spawners. So they don't like make a bed or do anything like that. They're very area specific, but most of your shad are going to sp- spawn on riprap at Smith mountain. And so what you're doing is you want to find pockets that have bait, maybe like in the ditches. And all we're waiting for is that water temperature to creep up like mid sixties, higher sixties. And then at night, um, at the beginning of the shad spawn, it's going to be earlier after dark, and that's eventually going to gradually get later and later and later. But basically as soon as the sun goes down in late April through like mid May, um, any bank that has riprap that's in those areas where there's shad, you're going to have shad up on the bank spawning. And what's super fun about that is you have every predatory fish, stripers, catfish, crappie, huge bass, largemouth, smallmouth, every type of predatory fish is going to just straight buffet style on shad for as long as the shad come up on the riprap. And um, so you have a lot of night fishing techniques that you can do, but a main one is throwing a topwater, a wake bait, um, something along the rocks that is imitating shad spawn. And, and I call it a rosy I don't really know how to necessarily describe it um, like using my voice, 
Um, but basically, it sounds <laughs> like it sounds like the shad are are running into each other and making a really small circle. Um, and so I don't know if anybody I don't even know what the uh, like term of the toy is, but like. It, do you know what I'm trying to say? Which to like, yeah, go it, watch blue planet and watch the tuna and how they, they, they do that big, that circle, that big circle, like yeah. the bait ball, but then put it in a smaller context. Yeah. Smaller context. So what you're doing on the shad spawn at night, and then I'll talk about the shad spawn in the morning, but what, what you're doing here at night is you're basically running banks. You want a calm night. You don't want a windy night. Those are, those nights are, are tougher to, to have the shad spawn, but you want a calm, warm night. And all you're doing is just crawling along on the trolling motor and waiting for them to make the rosies up on the bank. Um, and then you literally will hear what sounds like either a cannonball fell out of an airplane or someone flushed the largest toilet you've ever seen. Um, and you just have to be pretty stealthy about it. Um, if you have power poles, fantastic. Otherwise, if you're comfortable getting your boat really close to the riprap, the the number one tip I can tell you on shad spawn at night is if your bait is too far off of the riprap, you will not get a bite. And when I mean too far, I mean like two feet. Your bait needs to be barely banging into the rocks or six inches away from the rocks. And the reason being is the fish are actually facing up at the bank. They're not parallel with the bank. Like if you took a flashlight during the shad spawn, and this is all species, not just bass, um, and this was the bank I'm trying to do it. If this was the bank, they're facing this way at the rocks. And so if your bait is two feet from the bank, your bait is behind the fish that are looking up, um, at the bank. And you can see that with spotlighting, you can go down and you will see seven pound bass with their fins out of the water, just waiting for a shad, um, just waiting for a shad to, uh, Sorry, I got an alarm to uh, come by and and toilet bowl them, um, and so that's that's my number one tip is you're gonna get some lures stuck in trees, you're gonna get some lures stuck in riprap, but you do want to be as close to the bank as you can. Um, and then the follow up to that, like if you're fishing with a buddy, is somebody else should be throwing a Texas rig um, just slightly off of the bank, couple feet off of the bank, big curly tail worm something that's got a, a decent amount of movement to it, um, big craws with, with big pinchers or something, and just a super lightweight, um, just very slowly kind of dragging it down for any of those fish that aren't interested in, in actually sucking down the shad. So that's so the night when side you have of your it. clients, mm -hmm. when you have your clients, then what, what do you ask them to tie on when they go out with you? I'm assuming it's not like a rattle trap with 50 treble hooks. If you're going to be yeeting it onto some riprap, correct? Yeah. Or yeah. So, so I, I rarely do night trips, but I have done them and I am considering offering that if it's somebody that I know, that sounds like, fun. <laughs> yeah, that can, can act, you know, I've had repeat clients that I know can cast well and they're comfortable like in the boat at night. Um, I mean, there's some safety stuff we have to take into account too. During the day, you can wear sunglasses to protect your eyes. Like, dude, I have sa clear safety glasses in here for one, for running at night, because I hate when my eyes get watery and I'm running 30 miles an hour in the dark. It's freaky. Um, but two is like, I'll even like on a couple trips, like, hey, there's a lot of treble hooks flying around. Like, we're going to wear safety goggles just to be nerds about it. Um, but the earlier side so guide trips for me in the morning um things that are getting tied on is a fluke scrounger a thunder stick surge shad you know any sort of mega bass wake bait um shallow running crank baits uh prop bait anything that can kind of imitate that very like chimey sounding um shad sound um lots of beads, lots of kind of like chop sound to it. Um, and we're running, if I get a client on a cloudy day, we can run it longer. But if not, this is the time of year where I'm having guide clients meet me in the pitch dark. Like we're launching the boat in the mm -hmm. dark um, and we're running to a spot and we're maybe getting three banks before the sun's up, um, up high enough and the shad spawn starts to kind of taper off. 
and so basically, and this is the one thing that I guess it gets a little boring to me is basically the shad spawn is every bait that you've ever heard Bassmaster magazine growing up has told you to throw guys. So that's basically what you're doing here. The one, the one interesting thing I would challenge on that is the size. Cause I feel like a lot of times the Tennessee river system really dictates what big brands put out. And I feel like for the square bills, a lot of times I could be wrong. The, the square bills are way too big. Mm -hmm. A lot of times to make those thread fit. And I could yep. be, I could be wrong with that. Like, do you, do you see a lot of times that you do have to downsize, like you said earlier about the, the swim bait to really mimic that thread fin and people actually sometimes fish something too big. Yep. Yeah. I, um, one of my favorite, like little wake crank baits, I think I have one hanging up there. It's the Spro. Uh, I don't know if it's like considered a little John wake bait or whatever the name of the Spro one is, but it's like a zero to two foot. It's like a two inch crank bait. Um, but it's got some crazy hard wobble to it. Um, that's one of my favorite ones because it's 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 heavy enough I can have a client throw it on a spinning rod, and if I have them reel it slow enough, it doesn't even go under the surface. Um, and yeah, that's that's something that I will mess with is a little bit of size. Like I'll have some guide clients throw a torpedo. Um, it doesn't have to be some enormous five inch prop bait. Um, or, you know, I think a thunder sticks like seven inches, a surge sad is like seven inches. So it doesn't have to be something that big. It can definitely be, uh, it can definitely be something on the smaller side. Cause yeah, all the shad are not the same size. Um, and that's what was interesting about this early spring, not getting a lot of big swim bait bites, but crushing them on a smaller swim bait. And some years it's just like that other years it's not. And most years I end up throwing a two eight. They wouldn't really touch the two eight. It was more of a a three a three three a couple bites on a three eight, um, but just really hammering in on what the what the hatch size was was important. I will always be fascinated by that. How important matching the hatch can be sometimes, where they will snub a bait if it's not exactly the right size. That's just so fascinating to me that these fish are a lot smarter than we think. Sometimes it's just oh, yeah, so fascinating. We think they're dumb, but they're smart, and uh, then we think they're smart and they're dumb. And, and then, guys, to make sure I don't forget, I've been staring at the note all night, and I'm just actually reading it. Um, we're gonna add to the trip giveaway with this guy here. Um, if you go to his YouTube channel and you subscribe to the channel that will also enter you in a chance to win the guided trip with yours truly. And he'll even wear the captain hat possibly, uh, if you I win will, the trip as well, whoever wins, I will wear this hat or they can wear it. <laughs> they can wear it for the day. <laughs> they can wear it. For um, the day. and then, and we'll also try to get that live streaming going. We'll beta test that, but I think that'll be a, a pretty cool way to get some questions asked. I know you do your Instagram live. It, it, do you have a schedule for that that we can promote, or is it just when you have time? <laughs> because I know you're a busy yeah, man. yeah. I I uh, there's a buddy down here um, or a guy on Instagram named Calvin that that's been messaging me about some uh, about some ideas like uh, doing a tournament, more detailed tournament recap live and stuff like that. I probably will try to start start jumping on lives, um, a little bit more, a little bit more frequent. I got a, I got a list a mile long on YouTube videos that I need to make, but you know, that, that falls, uh, falls short when I'm, when I'm too busy and need some sleep. Cause I definitely need, I definitely need some sleep. Uh, well, I'm going to let you actually get to bed then Billy. Thank you so much for coming on. Um, is there anything that you want to, anything we forgot to talk about or anything you want to plug real quick? No, um, I do. I will say April was was insanely busy for me. I, f I feel super blessed. Anybody that watches this that came out with me, I, I really appreciate you guys um, booking and hiring me. And hopefully, you guys will come out again. And then, if anyone is is interested in in kind of that May June time frame, um, May's getting booked up pretty quick. June's June's still pretty open, but May is going to be that shad spawn that we just talked about. So if that's something you want to learn. Um, and get out early and kind of see that side of the fishing or how to catch them after that shad spawn bite dies. Um, May is important. And then June, hopefully by the books, June's uh, top water heaven, man, where you can come down here and throw top water all day long um, and smash them. So that's what the next couple months should bring. So if those interest you, then reach out. Guys, he's been on the lake for about 20 days straight. He hasn't slept at all. Uh, he is the guy that runs Smith Mountain Lake again. Everything we talked about, link in the episode description, everything we talked about today, including his website and his YouTube channel, so you can go over there and help support him. Again, like and subscribe to the channel. We are the number one fishing show in the DMV metropolitan area. We'll see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV.
with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.